It just seems like every day, every day there's something else. And uh, we're ready. We're so ready. But we know that you are in complete control, uh, that nothing comes as a surprise to you, that nothing is out of your, um, out of your grasp. And um, we know that everything works according to your perfect plan. And we know that you are, uh, you are sovereign. So, Father, help us to rest in that, whether we're here for another day or for another thousand, ten thousand, hundred thousand years, whatever it may be, we trust you. Uh, but, but we do, we do pray that we, as the church, um, would be salt and light uh, in this world, this dark world around us, this decaying world around us, even now. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, if you will, turn with me to Psalm 50 tonight. Psalm 50. What we'll do, we'll read, we'll read the whole thing in its entirety, uh, and then we'll take it from there. So that's Psalm 50. It's a psalm of uh, um, Asaph. In my Bible, it's entitled, The Lord Shall Judge All People. Um, this is Psalm 50, and it reads like this. The mighty God, even the Lord, hath spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun until the going down thereof. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God hath shined. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very uh, tempestuous round about him. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. It's very important. Who is he judging? Who is he, who is he looking to? Who is he calling out? Uh, it's going to be made clearer as we go through. Verse 5, Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice, and the heavens shall declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself. Selah. Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel, and I will testify against them. I am God, even thy God. I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifices or thy burnt offerings that have been continually before me. I will take no bullock out of thy house, nor he goats out of thy folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the air, or all the fowls of the mountain, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine in the fullness thereof. Will I eat the flesh of bulls and drink the blood of goats? Offer unto God thanksgiving, and pay thy vows unto the Most High, and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. But unto the wicked, God says, What hast thou to do uh, to declare my statutes, or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth? Seeing thou hatest instruction, and cast my words behind thee. When thou sawest a thief, then thou uh, contendest with me, and hast been partaker with adulterers. Thou givest thy mouth to evil, and thy tongue frameth deceit. Thou sittest and speakest against thy brother, thou slanderest thine own mother's son. These things hast thou done, and I kept silent. Though uh, thought hast that I, or that I was altogether such an one as my, thyself, but I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. Now consider this, ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver, and there be none to deliver. Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me, and to him that ordereth his conversation aright or his life aright, I will show the salvation. Of God. In what we know as the Last Supper, uh, many of us know, I mean, we, we know from the book gospel accounts about the Last Supper, Jesus takes bread at this time and he, he gives thanks and he breaks it and he gives it to his disciples. And what does he say? He says, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And Luke records that in the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, This is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. 
Now, we read this passage a lot at communion services, as we should. This is what we do. This is the reason that we take uh, of the Lord's Supper. It's, it's following in, in the footsteps. It's obeying Christ's command to remember what he has done, remembering that his body uh, and his blood was spilled out for us, his body was broken for us. In other words, we remember him as uh, our atoning sacrifice. We remember him as our, uh, our substitute. Uh, but I wonder, and I think we all do this, um, I think a lot of times we stop there. We remember that Christ is our sacrifice, that, that, that he has done this for us, but, but we stop there. We don't understand a lot of times that his sacrifices has made the way into this new covenant. This new covenant has been enacted in which we, the church, have entered into this new covenant. And what does that entail? It entails that we, uh, we interact with, we, we worship uh, a, a living God. So I think a lot of times we've we got to be careful in that we, we see what Christ has done for us and that his body was broken, his blood was spilled, but we don't live in the fact that he has been resurrected. We don't, we don't live in light of the fact that he has been raised from the dead. We don't live in, in, in light of the fact uh, that we are in this relationship. We understand what he's done. We understand the doctrine of things like sub- substitutionary atonement. But do we, do we live it out? Do we live out the implications of the fact that we, through that sacrificial atonement, do we live out the implications that now, because of that, we are entered into a relationship? Right? We oftentimes stop at the doctrine without going into that relationship. Jeremiah prophesied, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. Listen to what he says. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. Right? I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. This is speaking of the new covenant. And the new covenant is here. It's being expressed in the true Israel, where people from all nations are being brought into the family of God through faith in Christ. This is what we see, right? This new covenant that is written on hearts, not on tablets of stone. Uh, Ezekiel actually says that he is taking away that, that stony heart, right? And he's given us a heart uh, of flesh. In other words, what we're seeing is that through the new covenant, through what Christ has done, we are enabled to worship the Lord who can be known, Right, who can be entered into a relationship with. That's what we see here. No longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest. Now this is really significant. This is a really significant transition here. We're, we're to worship with our hearts. Right? Not just, not just the letter of the law. We're to obey the spirit of the law. We've talked a lot about this in the Sermon on the Mount, right? That Jesus is not just after uh, the fact that we don't do this or we do this, right? He's after the heart behind why we do this or don't do that, right? He wants heart obedience. Not just some wooden, religious, I've done this so I'm good type obedience. So through the new covenant, we are enabled to worship with our hearts uh, out of obedience. Um, Now, I I think um, oftentimes... uh, we sort of pit the Old Testament against the New Testament, and, and we think that the Old Testament is, is all about doing things right, keeping the letter of the law, uh, and we think more alongside of this idea of we are simply to be in the New Testament, right? We, we obey the spirit of the law, but oftentimes that we, we come away with this understanding that we live according to grace, and we don't really have to do a lot of things because that's that's kind of uh, legalistic and all this. So we pit one another against uh, uh, each other. And I think this is an incorrect way of reading 
uh, Scripture. Because both the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, what we see here expressed from the psalmist here in Psalm 50, both express the need for obedience, but it's an obedience with the right heart. It's an obedience with the right motives. And we're going to see that in Psalm 50. And we know that to be true. We've talked about it throughout the Sermon on the Mount. But we see it to be true here even in the Old Testament. The issue is that in the both the Old Testament and the New Testament, oftentimes uh, we get caught up in a distortion of o- obedience and heart worship. Whether in the, the Old Testament through things like the sacrificial system, which we see in view here, or the New Testament through things such as uh, uh, communion or w- baptism, whatever it may be, we sometimes do these things without our hearts. We do these things with the wrong motives or we do these things and then we turn around and live completely differently in the world around us. So these are the two issues that God is going to take offense to here in Psalm 50. We're going to see one group, uh, we can name them the religious um, or that, that, that simply follow religion uh, with no heart in it. We see that God is going to take issue with those individuals, and He's going to take issue with those that are going to be labeled the hypocritical group, the ones that speak God's Word, uh, but outwardly live completely different. So we're going to look uh, at those two groups. We first look in verses 1 through 6 at God as The judge. So we have to kind of orient our minds around God as judge here first before we see his indictment on these two groups. Now, much like Psalm 49 from last week, we have the psalmist here calling attention to the world. He's calling out to the whole world. But last week, the primary focus was on uh, the psalmist telling us truths about God, telling us truths about God. We don't see God speaking last. Well, certainly he spoke through the psalmist. But we don't, what we see is him telling us truths about God. But here, the primary focus is the psalmist calling attention to God speaking to his people, to God's actions toward his covenant people. So this is what he's doing here. The psalmist starts and he describes God as a faithful covenant-keeping God. We see that in the two names. He says, the mighty God even the Lord. So we see uh, he's using three different words to describe God here. We see El, we see uh, Mighty, which is El, we see God, which is Elohim, and we see Lord, which is Yahweh. And what this is, is a way to, to call forth into the world and identify God as a faithful, covenant-keeping God. This is the name that he gave uh, Israel. And, and so uh, this is very important as we consider certainly the relational aspect uh, of, of, of how we interact uh, with God. And so this God, this covenant-keeping, faithful God, He speaks and He summons the earth. His presence is shining forth from Zion. And He comes, it says, as a devouring fire and a mighty tempest in order to do what? In order to judge, in order to bring judgment upon someone or some group and it seems like it might be towards everyone towards towards all of the world but it kind of hones in rather to his covenant people when we see this image in verse 6 of God being the judge it says the heavens declare his righteousness for God himself is judge but we see that this is not judgment in the sense of uh, a final judgment but one of of God laying charges uh, against his people in the present, almost in the sense of a, a merciful warning. Uh, right? We see that he, this is a, a way of, of God trying to wake up these two groups. Maybe God, God might have done this in your life. I know in my life there are times where God needs to wake us up, right? He comes to us and he wakes us up. This is kind of what's going on uh, with his covenant people. We, we know from verses Four through five, it says he calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge who his people. And then he says, "Gather to me my who my faithful ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice." So in front of the whole watching world, we see this idea of him laying charges against his covenant people, and he's going to call into question their worship. And right, we we talked about some worship uh, with insincerity. 
uh, right, with a heart that is not directed toward Him. And some then are worshiping in a sense of wickedness where they, they speak God's Word, but their outward life, what they do on the outside, uh, uh, does not match what their confession is. So in essence, He's going to call out the religious and the hypocritical. So religious is first, and we see that in verses 7 through 15. I hesitated to use that word religious um, because it comes with a lot of connotations, but I think it, I think it, I think it works if we understand correctly what, uh, what, what God is trying to say here. Because I think religion, I think it really gets a bad rep sometimes, uh, within, especially within Christianity. Again, we, we like to think of ourselves as uh, new covenant believers. Um, we have grace on our side. We don't have to do anything, right? But that's totally, totally false. We, we looked at it... Uh, um, in the Sermon on the Mount, that re- uh, religion is part of what we do. We, re- we pray. We are to pray religiously. We are to, to give religiously. We are to fast religiously. We are to do these things, right? And so Christianity is, is in a sense, a religion. Uh, we don't like to label it like that, even though we, we do these things. Relig- we come here, right, on a Wednesday night religiously, right? So I think... Oftentimes we, we get a wrong understanding of what religion is. It's not wrong that we do these things. It's a good thing, right? We ought to pray often. We ought to give. We ought to fast. We ought to, co- uh, to come to worship together. We ought to do communion. We ought to uh, baptize new believers. All these things. All that is great. And we're going to see that, that the Lord uh, says that this is not actually the problem with the religious. The problem is not that we do these things. The problem here was not that they made sacrifices, which is what God told them to do, right? This is not the problem. The problem comes from doing these things with the wrong motivation or doing these things with an insincere heart. And what really begins to happen when we do that long enough is we become like these people in verses 7 through 15, where we begin to sort of sense, even if we don't say it from our lips, we begin to think that God needs our activity, right? That God needs our worship. And we begin to do these things and we we try to see it as a way to earn His favor because we're doing things for Him because he, He needs this, right? This was the case in the Psalms. And here in Psalm 50, the sacrificial system, the offerings in which are in view here, wasn't a bad thing. It was meant to draw them to God, right? It was a, it was a sense of uh, a way to be obedient uh, to God. But the Israelites saw their obedience oftentimes simply as merely a duty and, and nothing more. And it bred this mentality that God needed their sacrifices. This is why they continued to do it. Well, this in fact is the very essence of pagan worship pagan worship the idea that some some deity out there that we can't really know but this deity is that out there uh, needs our human sacrifice in order to survive thus worshipers must supply or else something bad is going to happen this is typically the way that pagan worship Happens. Sacrifices are enabled, enabled uh, are given to a deity in order that they survive. And if they don't give those sacrifices, what's going to happen? Something bad, right? And that's why we, uh, that's why pagan uh, religions would sacrifice children and different things like this. Uh, so this really, this idea is actually very pagan. But God makes clear that He actually doesn't need us to survive. He doesn't need our worship. He doesn't need us at all, actually. He says that our sacrifices are not to sustain Him. In fact, He says here He doesn't even need them. He says everything's mine anyway. Right? The psalmist says, Offer to God instead a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Perform your vows to the Most High and call upon Me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify Me. So what we see is that God doesn't need our sacrifices. He doesn't need our religion. He doesn't need our worship. He doesn't need any of that. Instead, He actually wants our heart, right? He wants our heart, a heart of thanksgiving. Calvin writes it like this, The design with which sacrifices were instituted by God was to bind His people more closely to Himself. 
Again, it's this idea of relationship. Why was this instituted? To bind his people more closely to himself and to ratify and confirm his covenant. And Sproul uh, concludes it like this. He says, while the sacrifices were important in that God had instituted them, they were not the end in themselves, but a means to glorify God. The same is true for us. Prayer is not an end in itself. Our worship is not an end in itself. Our giving is not an end. Anything that we do is not an end in itself. Rather, it's a means to glorify God. This is a theme that runs all throughout Scripture, not just in the New Testament. Even though, here's a good example, what did Jesus tell the, soccer, tell the Pharisees? What was a common refrain to the Pharisees? Go away and, and, and learn what it means that I desire what? Mercy, not what? Not sacrifice. Not sac- I desire mercy, not sacrifice. So this is a call to those who seek to do religion woodenly or or in this this sense of god needs it so i'm just going to continue to do it maybe i'll earn his favor but your heart's not in it your heart's far from him you're not seeking to draw close to him but the next is um the next is different uh but equally equally as bad we see it in the uh verses 16 through 21 uh, in this group that could just simply be labeled the hypocrites. Uh, the hypocrites, we see it in verses 16 through 21. There's another uh, example of a group where charges are brought against them, right? It, it's those who profess Christ but live differently. That's what we can say in our day. It's, it's a little bit different here. What we see here were that there were these that were, uh, that were speaking the Word of God, that had His, his covenant, that had His laws and all these things, on their lips, but in fact, when they go out, uh, they throw those words behind them. This is what we see. Wilcox states that he says, it's a scathing indictment, not on pagans and unbelievers, but of the wicked who recite God's laws and take His covenant on their lips. And that's clear from 16 through 17. But unto the wicked, God says, what hast thou to do to declare my statutes and that thou should take my covenant in thy mouth? Seeing thou hatest instruction and cast my words behind thee. So what we see is that very idea where we're speaking, we say, we, uh, we profess all of these things. We profess God's law and God's word on our lips but when we go out into the public arena, go out in public life, what do we do? We cast those things behind us. Right? We cast the word behind us so that, that it doesn't actually affect our lives. It may affect how people see us, but it doesn't affect our lives personally. And this is what we see here. Where, where they, uh, we see it in verse 19 that uh, at the same time, while they speak God's words, they also speak evil. They frame deceit and they slander. So we see this idea of, uh, of, of hypocrisy, right? Saying one thing but doing something else. Living a different life. Now this word hypocrite, it actually has the sense of, uh, uh, of an actor, especially in a play, where, where an actor will put on a mask, right? An actor will put on a mask, and what happens? The audience sees the mask, they see who this person is supposed to be, But what happens? When you go off stage, you take the mask off, right? And what is behind the mask is truly revealed. And you can put on another mask and another mask and another mask just to fit whatever uh, whatever scene is coming up or whatever scheme is coming up next. So the audience sees the mask, but they don't know the real person behind the mask. And this is what we see in this, uh, this indictment of hypocrisy. This indictment of saying one thing but doing something else. Like claiming to be this, but actually living like this. We know this to be true, right? Well, we don't really have to give any examples. Uh, we know it to be true in our own lives, right? Where we try to put on a good show for everybody else. And behind the scenes, we're not like this, right? We, we're as guilty as anybody when it comes to these two categories. And what we see is that to these individuals, or when we even fall into this, God says, I will reprove thee and set them in order. 
before thine eyes. I will reprove thee. Again, we see a sense, though, of mercy here. Now, these are, these are pretty, you know, pretty big charges laid against these two groups. But there's mercy here, isn't there? Because what does he say next in verse 22? Now consider this, you that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. Right? There's mercy in that he's telling us the fault in our ways, right? And he's saying, consider it and now correct it. Right? We see that in verses 22 through 23. So after rebuking both of these parties, God lays out the charges. What are these individuals to do? The religious, the hypocrite, what are they to do? They are to consider their ways. If not, God gives this conditional statement, if not, I will tear you into pieces. This is a pretty frightening uh, image right here. But God says what? Consider your ways and do what? What are they to consider? First, Kidner says it like this. The mechanically pious folk of verses 7 through 15 needed reminding that God is spiritual. In other words, they needed reminding that our worship should be from the heart. And he says the hardened characters of 16 through 21 must face, face the fact that he is also moral. And the fact that he has given us a standard by which to live. And we seek to live out that standard. Right? And, and the call, the call is for us to consider both of those warnings and to do what? Hopefully change, right? The call is ultimately for us to repent. That's what repent means. Repent means to, uh, to directly turn about, do a 180 degrees turn and we go, we march in a different direction. So instead of continuing to march on this, this path of uh, wooden religion or a hypocrisy, what God is saying, consider that. Consider the end to those roads and now turn. Turn. Repent. And, and he says here in verse 23, Whosoever offereth praise glorifieth me and to him that orders his conversation aright. What this means, orders their life correctly, will I show the salvation of God. So the call is ultimately for repentance. He's calling us to offer thanksgiving as a sacrifice. Not to continue just to do things in order to, to seek to try to earn His favor, do things uh, with this wrong attitude. In order, in others, he, or what He's actually saying is that we're to offer thanksgiving. We're to understand that this is a very merciful call that He is pointing out our sins and we are to actually follow Him. So we are to offer thanksgiving as a sacrifice. A heart that is right with God, that is satisfied in Him. A heart that is aimed towards pleasing Him. And ultimately what, this, what we see here is that this is what brings Him glory. We see, it, we see an example of this uh, through Samuel. When we see in Samuel, we see this idea that to obey is better than sacrifice. Right? To obey is better than than sacrifice. And while man looks on the outward appearance, what do we see? What does God look at? God looks at the heart. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Wilcock asks this, and this is how we'll close. He says, beyond all the religion, he says, is there a spiritual response to His grace and a moral response to His truth? A spiritual response to His grace and a moral response to His truth. Those two things are not pitted against one another. They actually work in agreement. Is there a spiritual response to His grace and a moral response to His truth? We're kind of coming, um, kind of running out of time. But what I want to do, because this needs to be something that takes a little bit more time than we have tonight. I'll give you homework, if you will. Ask yourself that question tonight. Ask yourself, is there a spiritual response in your life to His grace? And is there a moral response in your life to His truth? This, we need to consider this. We need to consider, are we falling into that, that first category of worshiping without heart? Or are we falling into that category of saying one thing but living differently? Maybe it's both, I don't know. 
We need to consider these things. We need to, we need to reflect on it. We need to reflect on it. We need to repent of the sin in our own life. And then we need to rejoice that we serve a living and merciful God. So take, this, take that home. Use Psalm 50 maybe tonight in your prayer. Or maybe wake up in the morning. Use Psalm 50. Meditate on it. Consider what God is saying. Reflect on it. Reflect on your own life. Repent of the areas in which He shows you that you need to repent and then rejoice at His mercy. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Father, we thank You for Your Word to us that is as relevant now as it was when the psalmist penned it in Psalm 50. Just like the Israelites where oftentimes they were just hardened and they were just doing religion in order to sort of uh, appease you and, and not seeing it as a way of drawing closer to you. We do the same thing. We do the same thing with, ah, i got to go to church today. You know, i got to read. You know, we do all these things so often when our heart's not in it. But we're also like the Israelites and then oftentimes we're, we play the hypocrite. We put on the mask of saying, we believe this and we believe that, but, but, our, but our lives speak something totally different. We are just as guilty. And we thank you that your word from the Old Testament and the New Testament both show us how we are to live our lives here and now, even in 2021. So Father, I pray tonight that each and every one of us here would consider what you were saying. Consider what you were saying. Help us to search our own lives, but most importantly, we ask that you would search our hearts. That your spirit would reveal in our lives the sin that is still dwelling in us. Father, help us to confess and to repent. And finally, help us to live a life where we rejoice every single day at your grace and mercy. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.